Okay, so I'm going to talk about single, double, and triple loop learning. This is different learnings about how we are doing our work, what the assumptions are underneath it, and how we can learn faster, and also how to support it. There's there's a lot uh, there's a lot that we want to have that helps us learn and to support the learning process. So uh, this is a sketch. Sketch planations. You could Google it and uh, get. Uh, you know, get, get a, on his newsletter. Uh, you're not supposed to copy it, but I have an arrangement with him. I give him a little money. So I have rights to do this here, but uh, there's a lot of stuff that's not talked about, like minimum business increments, first principles, value stream, impedance scorecard. Oh, that's an old, we used to call that, that's what we used to call it. It's now the value stream uh, f factors for effective value stream. So uh, that's an old label, but you get the idea. There are things we don't even see because nobody's talking about them. You know, this is, uh, Covey says it another way, the way we see the problem is the problem. But again, if we don't think and talk about what we see, we see what we're able to think and talk about. We got to get out of the echo chamber or the light chamber in a sense. Immutability limits this. It just does. It's just, if you say, oh, that's not scrub. Oh, that's not safe. You're just not going to talk about it. You're not going to go against the grain. And it's very insidious. Uh, the result is we don't see what we need to in order to solve our problems. We got frustrated trying to solve our problems in a way that's not effective. And then eventually we just abandon the whole thing anyway. And maybe we tell our manager, maybe we don't. Uh, so there are ways to do this. Now, one old way, and old, I mean decades old, is plan, do, study, act. Uh, sure, Deming cycle, whatever you want to call it, this is kind of uh, how I think of it is there's planning. You you set your objectives, determine what your next actions are going to be. You refer to your model of understanding. You do the work that you did. You study it to see what happened. Uh, then you go and you act. The act is adjusting your model and your plans. And notice how everything you do in this cycle is you're doing your work, plan, do, study, acting. You're you're managing the work and you're changing and questioning your model of understanding. Now this is the heart of lean learning. Uh, this is not something I see much at all in the agile space. Uh, certainly not in the scrum place space because there is no model of understanding like first principles. This is where we update our first principles, where we update our uh, factors for effective value stream. Now here's another way to show this. This is where single and double learning is. So you can see you got theory, practice, you see what happens. Single loop learning is about getting better at what you're doing. Oh, I didn't, I didn't estimate well, or we didn't get the sprint plan defined well. How do we do it better? So single loop learning gets us better at what we do. It actually enforces our habits. Double loop learning has us question our habits. Maybe we shouldn't be doing sprints. Maybe we shouldn't be doing flow. Maybe we should try to get more cross-functional teams. So double loop learning is challenging the what you're doing and the why you're doing it. Is there a better way to do this? So this is an interesting realization. And I, I'm gonna put, the, these are the same loops. I've added this here on triple loop learning, but I love, this comes from how buildings learn. I mean, there's a lot of stuff. Uh, uh, Chris Argeres is the guy who came up with double loop learning. So you could, uh, and I'll add a reference that, uh, but ironically, uh, I love architecture of buildings too. So I, I've been reading this book, How Buildings Learn. And it's amazing how much good agile stuff is in this in buildings of all things. And he talks about the history of how built, you know, take some buildings and show how they evolve. And I loved his description of single, double and triple loop learning the best, which is we're creating habits with single loop. How do we get better at this? That gets us more involved on looking at it. Double loop learning has us question our assumptions to make new habits. Uh, and uh, triple loop learning has us learn how to question our assumptions faster. So the triple loop learning is just this extra loop looking at this whole thing and seeing how we can do it. Now there's a, I don't have it on, on the screen, but there's something, um, I know some definitions I made once. I was trying to look at years ago, what's the difference between dogma and persistence? because they both seem to have people really kind of trying hard and struggling with things. And to me, I, I made the definition dogma was persistently working towards something without ever challenging your approach. Dogma is persistently working to get to a goal without ever challenging your results. And I define persistence as dogmatically trying to get something all without being attached to how you get there. This is the difference between the two. And if you're not doing double loop learning on your 
way of doing things. You're really just in a in an echo chamber and and uh, and uh, kind of blind, dogmatic. Now, what I have here is basically this is the single and double loop learning, but I want to contrast how PDSA plan do study act and how inspect and adapt. See, and in, in inspect and adapt, what we do is we see what happened and we're always inspecting and adapting, we're changing, or it's really focused more on single loop learning. Now you can challenge your assumptions, I guess, in terms of, well, how are we gonna implement sprint planning? But you're never challenging the absolute core that you're building it on. Whereas plan and do and act, the study and act, you have a loop here, but you also have a loop here to improve your mechanisms. I think this is very important. Okay, last part of this, talk about templates. Templates have been downplayed, um, derogatized, if that's a word, uh, and eschewed in the Agile space, and they're incredibly valuable. Their history comes from the B-17. And if you're interested in military or just engineering mistakes or whatever, uh, the, go, what the B-17 taught us about checklists, you can Google that, or I think that's a live link, whether it comes in the PDF, I don't know. But here's what was interesting. So prior to World War II, there were a couple of companies trying to get the next generation bomber for the Air Force. Boeing was one of them, the B-17. Some people have said this is the plane that won the war for us because, and other people have said other things about other planes too. Uh, but the B-17 is what bombed the German uh, manufacturing into submission. It was a brilliant aircraft. Uh, it could withstand a lot of pain. It had a lot of armament in terms of machine guns. It was studded with machine guns. So there's a couple in the tail. There's the turret gunner. There's one underneath. There are guns on the side. There are guns in the front, actually several guns in the front. Uh, you write that, put that in a nice for formation, and it's a formidable defensive unit. And it had a good navigation system eventually when they came up with that, that brilliant. Even before, during the testing, everybody knew this was the plane that was going to win. The only problem is that the final test, the plane crashed after takeoff. That did not impress the Air Force. Uh, and fortunately, although they lost the contract, the Air Force kept a little bit of money. It's such a good aircraft. What's, what went wrong? They, they kept a little bit of a live and Boeing itself. Well, they, they, this is crazy uh, because you got to remember, this is a major test. They had their best pilot, their best co-pilots. How did, could this happen? These weren't dumb people. These were their best and they crashed. And when they did an analysis of it, they found that they had forgotten to take off the lock. I think it was on the rear rudder or I'm sorry, the rear airline. It might've been the rudder. It was on one of these two things, either the elevators here or the guidance here. They take taken the lock off. So once it got in the air, they couldn't control the plane, crashed. I think one person died immediately. Another couple of people died later. Basically the crew was gone. How do we solve this problem? We got the best of the best. It's not that complicated. So they created the idea of a checklist. You see your pilots going through this. They still do it. The reason is, in this case, it's fairly stable. Yes, so you can't always use checklists. That's why in a, in a, in a B-17, you're like, ah, I don't feel like checking if I've unlocked the elevator. No, you always do it in this situation. This is why templates and knowledge work aren't this cut and dry because things change, but they can at least remind you of it. Now, here's how I got in checklists. I'm gonna tell a story on myself. So I used to do a lot of consulting. I would go into clients, I would talk to them, I'd ask them questions. It would be a really kind of cool engagement, okay? And uh, we would have all these discussions and I'm pretty free form, as you can tell even from these sessions here. And invariably, <laughs> the first half a dozen times, I did this, somebody would say, oh, Al, what about this? And I'm pretty quick on my feet and I'm honest, but I always like to still look better as I can. And I'd say, oh, I was just about to get to that. Thank you. <laughs> Where inside I was saying, crap, I forgot to mention that. And after a couple of times, I said, Al, you need to make a checklist. And after a couple more times, I'm not always fast. I decided to make a checklist. In fact, this is also part, I haven't released this to the ACEs yet, but one of the things I'm working on is what I call a collaborative engagement where the checklist is this big screen, this big mirror board with all the issues to look at. It's one of the ways we determine how you get started. You do this jointly with people and it acts as a template. Templates are really good. And I highly recommend reading this book uh, uh, about the checklist manifesto, how to get things right. And again, people just kind of talk about oh, checklists can't be good because that's all waterfall. No, it isn't. It's, it's not Taylorism. It's just taking smart people and giving them something to fall back on. One of the most interesting things he mentioned in this book to me 
was they did they looked at hospitals. They talk a lot about hospitals use these and hospitals mixed bag. A lot of people think they're doing lean in hospitals and they aren't. I've been in that one. And some who are doing lean in hospitals and it's an amazing difference. The experience is just dramatic. But he talked about where they were trying to get hospitals better in the ER when something went wrong. And what they found was that the hospitals with the best surgeons and the best staff, but without any foresight foresight into what could go wrong, were not as good as ones with average staff, average nurses, but who would look to see what could go wrong and had a checklist. And the rationale was this. When you're really, really good, you know it's gonna work okay, and you're not as prepared for what happens when it goes wrong. That's the first case, as when you're not sure what's gonna, you, you, you know something might go wrong and you've prepared for it. So we wanna be clear, that's what these checklists are for. That's what these man, man, um, manual manifestos about checklists is about. It's about how do we prepare for this stuff, not how do we prevent errors of any kind. Remember feedback, something went wrong, but I fix it quickly. The quicker your feedback, the faster you can go. Give you a quick thought experiment. How could you drive safely if you only looked around you once a minute? Well, obviously you gotta drive slow. That's why when I back out of, you know, of a parking place in a, uh, a parking lot is I go very slow because I know I can't see everything around me because the cars around me are blocking, I go slow. But if I was looking continuously every second, I go a lot faster. It's kind of interesting. Somebody said something interesting to me once said, what's the purpose of brakes? And you think, oh, the purpose is to stop safely. Well, the other purpose is so you can go faster. So if you didn't have good braking, you couldn't go very fast. So how do we get this? That's what these things are for. They're a thought process. Okay, so I like to look at what I'll call different levels of learning. There's I just mention it. Well, we're not talking about it, but the mere mention of it moves it from it's something I don't know and I don't know I don't know it to something I don't know, but I know I don't know it. I might get to it later. Maybe some ambition level. Why would you do that? What's a description of it? What's a strategy for implementing it? What's the cost, side effects of usability? And do you have a support method like, like Miro or that template screen I showed before? This is how you want to build systems. You don't want to overload people with everything at once. This idea that you have to have a simple system to not overload people is absolutely crazy with no evidence. Look at, look at uh, Wikipedia. You could double the amount of information on Wikipedia. They've got a way to navigate it. Amplio is designed to give it to you little bits, little bits, little bits as you needed it. It uses what I call a pull system for education. We're just now starting to see a little bit about Amplio as it's designed. I'm not going to go into it here. But we drive from a success strategy, stakeholders. What does success mean? What are their values? Human-centered design, so we make good products and innovate. We have a decision-guiding framework. Uh, that's what I've been talking about these sessions and, and uh, the last ones. How do we have appropriate learning methods? Short-term, because you're about to do something, or long-term, because it's a learning journey. So you can do this while you got a day job and learn as you go. This is very important. This whole thing is kind of pretty ignored in the agile space. It's like, oh, here's my framework, learn it, do it. Uh, it's how do you convey it? How do people learn it? All sorts of things. Okay, finally, the review. We don't think and talk about what we see. We see what we're able to think and talk about. If you're in an echo chamber where people aren't talking about stuff, you gotta get out or get another echo chamber. Two or three echo chambers are not so bad. It's kind of like uh, the way I do diets. I, I remember this time I, I uh, was on a diet and then I had to add another one. I wasn't getting enough food on the first diet. That's a joke. Uh, <laughs> so we have to challenge our assumptions. We use single, double, triple loop. We wanna support our thinking. This is very important. 